I have been asked to give a so-called vision lecture. So what I am going to say is some, something that I have got, actually I have worked hard at this, to distill whatever thing we have in India after a great distillation. What is it that India will face, India has to do in higher education? We are in a peculiar kind of situation in India. I don't think many people worry about it. Of course, Kapil Sibal knows about it. Many of us individually know about it. But there is very little being done about things. What is it that we are not doing? We have to look at India 20 years from now, 30 years from now. There will be a terrific surge of young people to come for education. There will be several, several more million people coming for education. I, hope, I don't know whether you have worked out the numbers. Some of us have worked out the numbers. It is actually frightening. Well, what will you do then? How will you administer India? How will you administer education in India? How will you control the quality? In other words, how you will have to do everything in a hurry because there is a huge rush of people coming from all parts of India, particularly rural India, where there is a lot of excitement about education. So how do we hurry slowly at that time? So this is, these are some, so I'm just going to give a bullet, a few points that I have noted down. Problems will get more severe in the future. If you think we're having problems today, I think they're very trivial compared to what we're going to face from what look, I look at it. Unfortunately, there is no seriousness about either examining or analyzing these issues and actually planning for those days that are to come. Let me tell you one simple number. Bangalore has 67 engineering colleges today. And actually, Karnataka admitted 65,000 students in engineering this year compared to total 75,000 in all of the United States. Total country admitted seven, more than 7 lakh students in engineering undergraduate this year. Okay, 20 years from now, there will be more people coming. Bangalore will have, instead of 67 engineering colleges, 200 engineering colleges. Is that the way to do it? We are we going to just linearly multiply everything by the population. How are we going to decide how the future of education and the future of our young people will be determined. Well, rural India, amazingly, many of you may or may not go. I am one of those persons who is doing, making a point last few years to give lectures in interior India all over, in Himachal Pradesh or Sikkim, doesn't matter where, or every year several of them just talk about science and the excitement in these parts is much more than the cities of India. And many of these bright young children will be the ones who will contribute to the future of India and they will need opportunities. So therefore, there is a serious manpower pl planning that one has to do in India. How are we going to direct these millions of children in different directions in education? They all should not be taking engineering, medicine and science. I mean, they should be doing something else. So this is a very serious task that we have to look at. For example, already there is terrific mismatch in manpower in the world already. I hope you all know that. I was just in China two, two months ago to give a lecture in Shanghai. What they are amazed is, you know, they are now suddenly producing 20,000 PhDs a year. According to them, they will be producing 40,000 PhDs per year in the next few years. Per year. What will you do with all those PhDs? The, well, will you have sweepers and janitors doing with PhD degrees, or what is it that they will do? I think India has to worry about that. So unplanned expansion of education without any objectives either in education or for employment, unplanned growth without thinking of the future of the young people will be very detrimental to India. And this, I think, requires serious attention and not much is being thought about here. Yeah, there are reports here and there. It's a very serious issue one has to look at. The second is about quality. I'm only giving eight points, I think, which are the essential points, according to me, for India, uh, India to look at, uh, for us to look at in higher education. Well, let us take IITs, India Institutes of Science, so many institutions which we think are the best of our institutions. Yet, you see, there's not a single institution in India which is comparable to the best in the world. We don't have an institution equal to an MIT or a Harvard or a Berkeley or a Cambridge. Why? Why is it this mighty country can't have a few universities and IITs or whatever institutions which are equal to the best? 
They're always talking about Harvard. You know, I have nothing at Berkeley because I studied there. I have nothing against Cambridge. I'm still a professor there. It, that is different. But do you want, don't you want a few institutions as good as the best in the world? It's a problem we have to think about very seriously. Or are we going to always say, oh, we have more students, we have more universities, we are doing, conducting exams, we are doing all kinds of things. Or are we going to say, look, you want to go to the best, get the best education? These are some of our best institutions, as good as the best in the world. So this is something India has to do something about, because the, whatever survey you look at, we don't have even a single institution in, from India in the top 50 universities of the world, or top 100. That is not a very nice thing. I think India has to seriously worry about it. And then Prime Minister recently announced that next year or this year, I don't know which year it is actually, I'll try to find out from him, is the year of science. And uh, if so, I'm going to request him to make one thing. Let us pick 10 or 15 institutions in India and do everything possible to see their levels are raised to the best in the world. Can we do that? I'm not saying it can be done. I'm saying these are all the problems we have to look at. In terms of research performance in our institutions, well, you know, we are publishing papers. The number is not so bad. India is publishing not as much as China, but reasonably all right, numbers. Quality, top 1% of the world research, if you take India's contribution is less than 1%. I think we have to worry about that quality of science and research that comes out of our educa higher educated institution. The reason I'm mentioning research along with education is there's no point having a higher education institution without research. The best education is given provided when only in an atmosphere where research is done and the best research is done where good teaching is also there. So these, are, these go hand in hand. These are, this is the second point I thought I should mention as a serious one that we have to examine. Well, many years ago, there was a, I don't know, I don't even remember how many years ago, probably more like 30 or 40 years ago when I was a young professor in IIT Kanpur, 40, 45 years ago. We had such serious debates on examination system in, the world, in India. But the examination system continues and examinations determine Indian education. The children are not interested actually whether they do well in higher secondary examination or not, as long as they can somehow pass the entrance examination to an IIT. Some exam or the other, whether it's the final examination or the entrance examination. The other day, one of my friends is now the chairman of the Medical Council of India. Yeah, I, I have to talk to him, in fact. I'm not very happy with some of the statements they're making. They say, after all the great MBBS or MD degrees you get, you, you do all that by all kinds of selection exam, don't forget. Always entrance exam, other exam. They take 20 exams before they're getting admission to an MD. Then they say, is our MD good enough? They want to have a another examination to make sure the quality of our medical degree is good. So there's no end. Go on, it is like an Agni Pariksha for your wife every day. I don't think we are married, you know, what a wonderful wife, leave, leave her alone. I think there's no end to testing ourselves and accrediting ourselves every night. And I think this accreditation is going on with all due respect to some of these people, my colleagues who have been involved in accreditation. It has gone on, but I'm very unhappy with the way we do the accreditation. I think it is not the best way. We have to look at how to do the accreditation, our own degrees, how to value our education. We have to learn it soon because we've got hundreds of these children coming up. Thousands of colleges will be there. You can't go on do, do the way you are doing it now. And there's not enough time and money or effort. The effort required is so enormous. We are giving thousands of MDs and MBBS. How are you going to each, you take each of them, make them take another exam? I had to take an IIT exam. They go through so many coaching classes. They take exams to attend the coaching class also. There's no end. So we have to worry about entrance exams, selection exams, that exam, this exam. So the entire young population is subjected to this onslaught of examinations which has destroyed their mind. I have been one of the original professors of IIT. I tell you, I was associated with IIT Karakpur when it started with my teacher, Sergei Sikosh, who was the first director. I was a student. I'll never forget the excitement of being an undergraduate in an IIT. Today, examinations is of IIT is giving students which are no, who are no longer equal to the best of students we had in the early days because they're exhausted by the time they enter IIT by taking exams. And in fact, 
These entrance exams for all these, in fact, if you want to be a medical student, MD, even, not even MBBS, you take so many entrance exams, you are really exhausted. Some of them, well, <laughs> I know one case, people almost commit suicide when they don't get admission, particularly in engineering, in IITs. I think it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. Our children, are, their minds are being destroyed instead of being helped to become better engineers, better scientists through examinations. This is something we have to think about. I'm not giving you a solution today. Why, what are the things that we, I would do uh, uh, to do something for India of the future? Talent search. Well, you know, I live in India. India, for a longer time than most others. I've lived here for a very, very long time. And I've been a professor for 52 years now in India. I can tell you, I need, see this so decline in motivation, interest, excitement, interest in scholarship, which is unbelievable. This is mainly because I live in a city called Bangalore. Bangalore has slowly become a city without a soul. Everyone wants to make money, everyone is well-dressed, everyone is busy, but there is something missing in Bangalore. And if that happens to the rest of India, God only save India. I think we need people who are excited about learning, excited about their profession, excited about doing something creative. See, in the urge to make money, urge to do, succeed, everyone wants to become rich. This is the attitude of young people, at least in Bangalore. I'm told that something is similar in Hyderabad. But fortunately for us, this is a negative point. The positive thing is 60% or more of our population in the rural India where this has not happened. We have to do something for rural India. Whenever I go to rural India, right interior Karnataka or Maharashtra, where many places where I go to give lectures to young children, I'm amazed at the excitement. I'm amazed at the wonderful students, our students of Navodaya Vidyalayas, very, very excited about science, very excited about learning. I'm not talking about science today, I'm talking about anything, anything that they're interested in. I think we should do something for rural India, because the future talent of India to do creative things or innovative things in India will come from, will come from rural India. The way I look at it, with the millions of population in rural India, there must be an Einstein, there must be a Faraday, there must be a Newton in India. But where are those? Why are we not picking them up? After all, statistically, it must be true that India has some of the brightest minds in our villages. No doubt. Because all the population is there. But we are doing nothing about it. We are doing very little, in fact. So, Kapil Sibal, I keep talking about him, uh, with him about this. I'm sure this has to get some importance, how to look for talent in interior India and what we have to do in the future to see that the best of them come and serve India in various ways. Point number five. Well, you know, Prime Minister recently said in the Science Congress, let us relieve science from, in India from bureaucracy. Let us be able to liberate them from bureaucracy, he said. Well, I think, let us, I think the entire country needs to be liberated from bureaucracy. <laughs> If you ask me, not just, education is the most bureaucratic, has the most bureaucratic administration than any other part of the country. How come that we have IAS, look, today I, I, I have, I'm not afraid, I'll say whatever I want. You see, that is one of those bad qualities I've had. I, I'm unable to tell lies, and I'm not afraid. It doesn't matter. How come an IAS officer can run education? What does he know about it? There may be good IAS officers who are interested in education, I don't mind. They're doing it. But routinely, people are, are, are transferred to become a secretary for education, additional secretary, to deal with IITs, for example. This man, IIT, he doesn't know what, anything about technical education. He doesn't know anything about engineering. He doesn't know anything about science. But he runs IITs. So this is the kind of thing. So 